to give you an overview of uh, the most important unsupervised technique. And uh, the reason I'm bringing that in today is because I first want to give you an overview of you know, the whole breadth of pattern recognition and we can go into more details in uh, particular uh, topics. So uh, the main topic of today will be principal components analysis. It's the most important uh, linear dimension reduction technique. Uh, but as a preliminary to that, I will talk about uh, the curse of dimensionality. And uh, after that, I will talk about uh, the singular value decomposition. Uh, as a reminder to those who've seen it before, and then I'll talk about uh, related techniques, probabilistic PCA and uh, probabilistic latent semantic analysis. And by the end of today, you should know what all these words mean. Um, so just uh, uh, for my sake, uh, who has heard of principal component analysis before? Okay. Um, in what contexts? Can you just start here? In lecture one, Roman. Okay. How about you? Okay, and in the back? Okay, and there was somebody else? Recently, or, oh, okay, good, good. <laughs> okay, so you see it all comes back together, you know, the seminar and lectures. <laughs> Okay, there was PCA, and how about uh, the SVD, the singular value decomposition? One, two, okay, three. So it's a, uh, you know, it's just a numeric technique, but one uh, in which uh, many problems can be very conveniently phrased. Okay, then about uh, the curse of dimensionality. Um, It's a term which has been coined, uh, I believe, in the 60s to describe a couple of uh, phenomena that uh, escaped uh, human intuition. So uh, why in the 60s? Uh, because this was the first time that uh, people were confronted with really uh, high dimensional data. So uh, in the old days, uh, you know, when, let's say, when linear regression was developed, uh, people had matrices. Uh, I'm using a big X to uh, indicate the matrix collecting all our observations. And uh, people had a relatively small numbers, relatively small number of features P and hopefully a large number of observations N. So altogether, you know, we have this P by N matrix and in the old days uh, we had N much larger than P. And by the way, uh, this arranging of the dimension, so using uh, a P by N matrix rather than N by P matrix, uh, this runs contrary to most textbooks uh, and it's only a matter of convention, okay? So there's no deep uh, truth in using one or the other. The reason I'm using uh, this particular um, convention is that when, when we write a single vector of observations, so uh, we have single measurement with multiple observations or with multiple different features measured, then we typically write a small vector x and this is a column vector. And if we now go from having a single observation to two or three, I think it makes more sense to stack them as neighboring column vectors rather than suddenly invert the whole thing, okay? So this is why I'm using this convention here. So in the old days, we had N much larger than P, uh, number of observations much larger than number of features. And uh, nowadays, uh, so, so nowadays starts somewhere in the last 50 years, uh, we occasionally have data sets where uh, n can be smaller or much smaller than p. And a typical example uh, from the past decade or two that has 
stimulated research a lot uh, was these uh, gene uh, or these microarray analyses where we have perhaps 100 patients but perhaps uh, 10,000 gene expression levels. And this has uh, stimulated a lot of very good work and uh, has led to interesting new research directions in uh, statistics also. Okay, so uh, nowadays we sometimes have uh, n much smaller than p. So we have to look at high-dimensional spaces and there are some concepts that easily generalize to high-dimensional spaces. So for example, uh, the definition of the Euclidean distance uh, you know, once you've managed to generalize from one dimension to two, you will manage to generalize it to p dimensions. Or similarly, uh, if you talk about uh, the edges of a hypercube, uh, you know, the edges of a hypercube you could uh, write as 0, 1 to the p dimensions. So this is also something that easily generalizes. However, it is the proportions of high dimensional bodies and distributions that often escape our intuition. And uh, this poor compatibility with our intuition with that has been you know, educated in two and three dimensions, this is what gives r rise to this apparent curse of dimensionality. Okay, so uh, let's say that the proportions dimensional bodies often do not conform with our intuition. And whenever there's something that you don't understand, then it's quite, you know, it's apparently in human nature to then become superstitious and talk about curses and voodoo and all that. So this is uh, where this habit comes from. So I want to give you a couple of examples uh, for the statement that proportions of high dimensional bodies uh, do not conform with intuition. The first example will be the uh, radial mass distribution of a standard normal distribution. So this is a plot of the radial mass distribution of a standard normal distribution, first of all, in one dimension. So you, you see this is just half a Gaussian by symmetry. Uh, this is what makes sense. Now note that uh, the highest density is, of course, at the origin, you know, as is always the case for the Gaussian. Uh, however, now if we ask in two dimensions, where does the mass of a 2D Gaussian lie, then we we have a qualitatively different behavior. So now this mass distribution starts at zero, peaks here, and then decays somewhere beyond uh, three sigma. So most of the mass can be found at some distance of the origin here in two dimensions uh, around the standard deviation. And now as you go to a 3D, a three-dimensional Gaussian or a four-dimensional Gaussian or a five-dimensional Gaussian, you see that um, the mass shifts further away from the origin. And this, even though uh, the, the probability density is always highest at the origin itself. And well, the reason is just, uh, if, if you do the calculus, it comes from this uh, volume element when you do the integration. Okay, so if you integrate over uh, onion shells, uh, then uh, the larger onion shells have a much you know, bigger part of the volume. On the other hand, you have this exponential decay. So on the one hand, the volume element uh, becomes ever larger as you go out. On the other hand, you have the exponential decay of the probability. And as a compromise between these two, um, you find a, a peak somewhere in between. Um, I have plots of these volume elements. So these are the radial volume elements uh, here for different dimensions as a function of radius and uh, for different dimensions. And uh, I've also included a logarithmic plot here. 
and uh, I've also uh, included a plot of hyperspheres because at least I also find that, uh, I found that surprising at first. Um, so uh, we have uh, here plots for different radii and here different dimensions. And so for a given radius, the volume of a hypersphere increases as you, uh, uh, as you increase the dimensionality. However, uh, beyond some point, it starts to you know, decrease again. Um, then, so that's a nice uh, empirical example, a uh, very simple paper here from 1999. Uh, these people just generated random data in, uh, I think, uniformly distributed uh, random data in uh, different dimensions. And they now looked at all pairs of neighbors and studied the ratio of the largest distance between any two points divided by the minimal distance of any two points. And in low dimensions, you know, the, the largest distance divided by the smallest distance is some large number. However, as you now go to higher dimensions, you can see that this ratio of largest versus smallest distance uh, approaches uh, unity. So in other words, uh, the pair of points with the largest and the smallest distance, uh, they, they roughly have the same distance now in high dimensions. This holds for truly high dimensional distributions. Okay, so I think uh, the, uh, if you can recognize the triangle symbol here, so this is a uniform distribution, so just numbers randomly distributed in a hypercube in many, many dimensions. You know, and many, many, this is just 100. Uh, you know, that's nothing compared to the 10,000 I mentioned uh, earlier on. Uh, so, if uh, the numbers are, uh, I'm missing another plot here somewhere. Okay. Um, so, what I've said before about the radial volume element, uh, it lets you think that, uh, or at least it let me think, that the mass should lie far away from the origin uh, in general. And uh, in particular, uh, now for, again, for uniform distribution, uh, I would have expected that uh, the, the corners of this uh, uh, hypercube, they have the biggest mass. Uh, but that is not the case. And this is a plot uh, from Eric Agrell uh, from Thomas University. Uh, he has uh, plotted here an, I think, uh, eight-dimensional hypercube. And... Uh, uh, so we would have to count uh, here the corners uh, to know for sure. And uh, this plot represents how much mass you can find uh, at what distance from the origin. So at the interior of the cube, you find nothing because the spherical volume element is so small. But the corners of the, pu of, of the cube are also empty because, well, they apparently are very you know, thin in some sense and the mass uh, lies at an intermediate distance. And uh, the fact that this mass lies at an immediate distance uh, at least is something uh, that can be understood. So, uh, let us look at uh, a uh, random variable with a couple of uh, components. total of p components and each of these uh, components should be uniformly distributed on the interval minus one half to one half. And we can now uh, ask for the expected square difference to the origin. So we sum over the dimensions. And because these random numbers are, uh, so IID is a shortcut for independently and identically distributed. Uh, identically distributed means according to the same distribution. Independently means independently. Um, 
and uh, if you remember what we said last time about uh, you know the uh, uh, the expectation of, of a sum versus sums of expectations and so on, we can uh, rewrite this as the sum of the expected uh, distance of a single one of these uh, uh, features. And uh, because this is centered around zero, this is just the variance of xi, uh, which uh, for the uniform distribution is uh, one twelfth. So uh, altogether, we have um, p divided by twelve for the average square distance. So the average distance would be the the square root of this. Um, so the uh, and that's a little more than uh, one half. So this is where on average the points lie. And while the variances of the individual contributions sum up for the standard deviation only grows uh, you know, as a square root of that. Uh, so by the law of large numbers, it means that the points in high dimensions as P goes to infinity, they become ever more concentrated uh, at that distance of the origin. So, uh, bottom line for a uniform distribution in a hypercube in very high dimensions, most points lie at a distance of uh, uh, 0.8 times the radius of the circumscribing sphere. Okay, and then it looks like that. And again, regarding neighborhood, I have um, <coughs> one example for you here. So uh, I have taken, uh, uh, I've randomly sampled points from a uh, 2D square. And I have indicated the so-called Delaunay triangulation. So there are many ways to define triangulations, but uh, the Delaunay triangulation is in some sense uh, a very natural choice. Uh, the Delaunay triangulation is, by the way, um, it's the dual of uh, the Voronoi decomposition. So let's say uh, each of these uh, nodes here is one observation, and I can now partition. Uh, so I have an observation here and here and there, and I can now find the Voronoi regions, as we did for um, the one nearest neighbor method, and the Voronoi region will look uh, something like that. The Voronoi region of this point, uh, of this central point, and you now see that wherever my Voronoi region has a boundary, the Delaunay triangulation has an edge. So in this sense, the Delaunay triangulation is dual to the Voronoi decomposition. So it's a very fundamental concept. So I've indicated here um, who is a Delaunay neighbor of whom, and we get this nice triangulation. Now I have added a tiny little bit of noise in the third dimension. And so instead of getting triangles, we now get tetrahedra. And now most power points start to see many, if not most others. And if I now added a little bit of noise in the fourth and fifth dimension, which becomes hard to plot, um, um, then you know, if I project this onto the first two dimensions, as I've done already in this case here, uh, then we would see that very soon each point becomes a neighbor of every other one. Okay? So the concept of neighborhood somehow becomes uh, distorted in multiple dimensions. Or in other words, if you have a high dimensional space, you need very many observations to fill the space. And that in turn means it is hard to estimate models reliably in multiple dimensions. Okay, any questions? So this was uh, the bad news part, um, saying that uh, there is something difficult uh, going on in multiple dimensions. And now comes the good news. Um, the good news is that, uh, in fact, 
the intrinsic dimension of uh, most data sets is not as high as the nominal dimensionality. We have to always distinguish between nominal versus intrinsic dimensionality. Um, the nominal dimensionality for such a data set would simply be P, so the number of features you have measured, and intrinsic dimensionality is the true dimensionality of the of your data set. Uh, this is especially important in image processing because let's say uh, we want to reliably recognize a given face. I can take uh, an image of this face with a webcam. This will have a million pixels. So the nominal dimensionality of the image of the face would be one million because I have made one million measurements. Now, let's assume that uh, we have a lamp shining on this face under well-controlled conditions. Let's say the face is perfectly still you know, does not smile, does not frown, does not shave, you know, it's just perfect, same face. And now we start moving uh, the illumination from uh, left to right, the source of illumination, and we take different images for each of these illuminations. Now, uh, as the shadows and the light moves across the face, uh, almost all measurements will change. So uh, uh, almost all pixels will have a different value fr from what they had before. And if we uh, take as representation this uh, Cartesian space of all gray values measured in all pixels, just moving uh, our lamp will lead to some complicated trajectory in this space. However, the intrinsic dimensionality of this change will be just one because we simply moved our light source. So we will have some uh, you know, difficult curve trajectory but locally, intrinsically, the dimensionality of this will be just one. And so in many data sets, we try to find this manifold or this, subs this subspace on which data truly lives. And typically, this subspace is of much, much smaller dimensionality than uh, the nominal one. So coming back to faces, if you want to describe faces, you could say, okay, the face is broad set or not. Uh, um, you can say if the person has glasses or not, uh, what, what hair color, etc. So you can, you can ask a lot of questions until you describe <coughs> a face. And this is something, uh, you know, if people try to, do, to draw a mug shot. So somebody has committed a crime, some witnesses have seen the person, and then, you know, you, you play question and answer with the witnesses to arrive at the face. And you, know, you might ask them 100 questions, but you're not going to ask them a million questions. So it looks like um, the manifold of faces is probably more like 100 dimensional than a million dimensional. Okay? So because the data often lives in a subspace of much lower intrinsic dimensionality uh, means that often, even though the nominal dimensionality is high, we don't always encounter this curse of dimensionality because the date, because this manifold might lie in a very high dimensional space, but the data itself or the manifold itself is low dimensional. And since we only work with the observations on this manifold, uh, often we don't have the kind of problems uh, that I sketched above. Okay, now we often want to find this manifold and uh, the most important method or the best known method is a principal components analysis, which assumes that this manifold is linear. I think I said before that human science seems to be robust, so the really important concepts are found uh, again and again. 
And this is the case with principal components analysis. So uh, it has been reinvented many times and it hence has many names. So the fluid dynamics people, they call it proper orthogonal decomposition. Uh, it's known as the kahuna löwe transform, uh, I think as the Hotterling transform. So it, it comes under a couple of names, but this is the most important one. Um, and the aim here is to find the best, in a sense that I will define, linear subspace that approximates our observations. Now, you could define best in many ways, but uh, the definition used here will be in the sense of minimizing the sum of square distances from the subspace. And it is used uh, for many purposes uh, amongst them uh, dimension reduction, so trying to find a lower dimensional representation for your data, or compression, so trying to store your data set uh, so lossy compression, uh, you, you are willing to sacrifice a little bit of information, but you will use uh, much fewer bits. Um, it's also useful for visualization, as I will show. Um, it's described in many places in the literature. Uh, a paper that I like is by B. Christiniani and Rosipal. which is called eigenproblems and pattern recognition. It deals with much more than just principal components analysis, but it gives you a nice uh, summary from a linear algebra point of view. Okay, uh, so we... I will first assume that uh, the data has already been centered. So uh, we need to first subtract the center of mass of our observations. Um, we can use the centering matrix uh, that we saw last time such that uh, once I've centered my data So X is again the uh, P by N matrix of my observations. And one is a vector of ones. And if when I've centered my data, then uh, this should hold. And now there are two uh, formulations. I will uh, and show that they are the same. I will start with uh, the formulation that finds the subspace such that our data has the maximum spread in the subspace. So we're looking for that subspace that best explains, that has the, the largest spread possible of our raw data. So I'm looking for the first principal component, so W is just a vector for now. And Um, w transpose X is uh, the projection of my data onto this, uh, well, onto to this one-dimensional subspace, onto this vector, and I want to maximize the square of this uh, entity. So I'm projecting all my points onto W, and I want to maximize uh, the sum of uh, squares of, uh, of the spread. Now, uh, to prevent W from going to infinity, I need to somehow uh, restrict the length of W, and I'm restricting it to 1. Okay, now this... Uh,
I can uh, write uh, this uh, squared Euclidean distance out by saying this should be should be that. And this condition that the norm of W should be 1, I can uh, enforce by means of a Lagrange multiplier. So I have a Lagrangian and can differentiate it with respect to and I'm doing this explicitly because I'm, I'm not sure if you're used to taking derivative with respect to vectors rather than scalars. Um, so up here, this is just a scalar. And if we now differentiate this scalar with respect to a vector, you would expect to get out something that also has uh, the shape of a vector. And uh, you can do this you know, really explicitly, uh, component-wise, if you like. Um, but what you find at the end is that uh, here, this is, you know, it's like a squared uh, expression. So we find that minus if we want that to be zero. And we hence find uh, this eigenvalue problem. given here. So we want to, uh, uh, these are all the uh, stationary points and uh, all the permissible solutions and we want to find, uh, we want it to maximize. So the solution will be given by the largest uh, eigen value or the eigenvalue between, yeah, the largest eigenvalue and the corresponding eigenvector. Um, this is the subject of the Rele-Ritz theorem. Okay, and once we found this uh, so solution is given by the eigenvector of the largest eigenvalue. And uh, once we've found this W1, we can project it out. So we will uh, we will project our data onto this uh, first component that we found. So this is now my low dimensional approximation. And I will subtract this low dimensional approximation from uh, the original observations, and that will give me an updated uh, data set, you know, call it uh, maybe x2, uh, on which we can then uh, do the same thing again. In, in practice, of course, you would uh, really solve uh, this whole symmetric eigenvalue problem at once uh, using matrices. Now this was the viewpoint of uh, maximizing the spread in the subspace, but we can uh, equivalently minimize the, the sum of the square deviations from the subspace. Equivalently, we can minimize the norm of the residuals. And for that, you know, we will use this uh, expression that we had just seen. So we minimize subject to W being uh, of unit length. Okay, 
So this is uh, our original matrix, and this is also of matrix form. And the difference between these two is also matrix. And what you see here is the, so the capital F represents the Frobenius norm. So Uh, the Frobenius norm is defined as follows. If we have some matrix A, then it is given by the square root of the sum of all the squared elements. And that can be rewritten uh, conveniently as the square root of the trace. Of A transpose to A or vice versa. Okay, so we can, uh, using this uh, expression here with the trace, and you see, because we have the square, we can uh, omit the square root. We find that we want to minimize Now I'm, you know, all of this is my matrix A, so I'm multiplying this out, out now. So I'm saying, uh, uh, I'm using this formulation here of A transpose trans, trans A. Now we can do two things. Uh, the first term here is independent of W. So uh, I can omit the first term from the minimization problem. And secondly, we have uh, required that the norm of W be 1. So this is just a scalar 1. I can omit it. Then we have minus twice plus once this term gives me overall and because the trace is invariant under cyclic permutation I can rewrite this as And if we now look at the dimensionality of these things, so W transpose is uh, 1 times P, and X was P times N, X transpose was N times P, and the last W was P times 1. So overall, this is just uh, an entity of dimensions 1 by 1. It's just a scalar number. And well, the trace of a scalar number is just that scalar number. So this gives me so I want to minimize minus this expression and down here we wanted to maximize plus that same expression so you see that uh, the, the two approaches give the equivalent optimization problem. So this is equivalent to the criterion we previously had. 
so uh, overall, if we solve for this, we find that principal component analysis, it finds a subspace with the smallest sum of square deviations from it on the one hand, or it finds a subspace with the biggest spread of uh, points along them. Okay, now no lecture on PCA without this image. So say these are our observations. And the optimization problem we now have I have required that the data be centered, so the origin lies uh, somewhere in the middle of this cloud. And I'm now looking for a vector w that maximizes the spread of points along it. And you know the solution in this case would look something like that. So this would be our first principal component. And if we now approximate the data in this subspace, we simply uh, project it uh, orthogonally onto the subspace. And we would then summarize the coordinates by just uh, the score on this single axis. So I have a um, couple of comments. Well, which I will start making after the break.